Welcome back to Immunology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tilkoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe for future videos. All right, in the past two videos we talked about the classical pathway and the lectin pathways for complement activation. Mentioned that the classical pathway requires antibodies to get started. The lectin pathway is antibody independent and it instead relies on sugar, specifically mannose residues on the cell surface of pathogens and that's what causes it to become activated. The pathways are pretty much identical other than the initial activation step. The C3 convertase is identical in terms of what, com what comprises it. The C5 convertase is identical. Um, the order of activation of complement proteins is identical. The alternative pathway not only is different in the order of things being activated, but the, the players, the proteins are actually different. Okay? And the, the way it's activated is also a little bit different. The classical pathway is only active if you have antibody bound to antigen. If you have no antigen, then there's absolutely no activity. The lectin pathway, if you have no pathogens, there's no sugars and therefore there's absolutely no activity. There is always some baseline activity of, of the alternative pathway. Why? Because even without antigen, there is some level of C3 hydrolysis in solution. Okay, now this should actually not be a B here. It should just be C3. But C3, as we've talked about in previous videos, these proteins, these complement proteins, have an internal thioester bond. Now, at some level, some baseline level in solution, even without antigen, this thioester bond hydrolyzes uh, in solution. So water can do a spontaneous attack on this thioester carbonyl, and it's going to split the C3 into a carboxylic acid and a thiol, which is the cysteine residue. This is actually a glutamate residue, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Now this says C3B just because it's on the C3B component if it were split, but this is just on C3. Now when water hydrolyzes that thioester bond, we give that C3 a special name. We have C3 with the in parentheses water. We call that hydrolyzed C3. Okay. Now it turns out that hydrolyzed C3 um, is actually going to be able to combine with another protein called protein D. Protein D is a serine protease which is actually going to split another protein called protein B into, and this is where it gets confusing, into BA and BB. Okay, I mentioned this in other videos so if this is foreign to you go back and watch those. When we have proteins that are split in the complement system the component that floats away is called the A component. The component that remains bound is the B component. This is just really confusing because the protein itself is called B. So the part that floats away is BA, and the part that stays is BB. Okay? That BB remains bound to the hydrolyzed C3. Okay? And remember, that C3 is hydrolyzed to some extent always, even when there's no antigen present. That spontaneous hydrolysis that's a baseline level is some co sometimes called tickover hydrolysis. If you see tickover in your textbook, that's implying that we're talking about the baseline hydrolysis of this. And it's able and protein D is able to produce BB which complexes with hydrolyzed C3. Okay? Now here's this pathway here. And I want to preface this. The alternative pathway is very different. The C3 convertase is different. The C5 convertase looks different also. However, the end result of producing a membrane attack complex is the same. Here's the step we just talked about. Protein D splits B into BA and BB. Now we have this BB complex to hydrolyze C3. Now, this hydrolyzed C3 and BB themselves are going to have some C3 convertase activity. These proteins are free in solution. They're not membrane bound yet. But because of the C3 convertase activity, they're able to convert C3 into, you guessed it, C3A, which goes away, and C3B. This C3B 
is different than C3 water. This is hydrolyzed C3. It, it, all that happened was a water hydrolyzed that internal thioester bond. Now here, this C3B actually is going to bind to the membrane. I'm going to scroll up here and find a picture, and I'm going to actually put it down here. Here we go. Let me actually go back here. C3B, remember, has that internal thioester bond, so a serine residue, for example, on a protein on the surface of the bacteria can actually attach itself to the carbonyl of that thioester bond, and now the C3B protein is now attached to the bacterial surface in an ester linkage, okay? So that C3B there is now bound, okay? Very much in the same way as free in solution with hydrolyzed C3, protein D, this should also be a protein D here, can split B into BA and BB. The BB is going to remain bound to this C3B that's now attached to the surface. Now, this P, what is that? P is a, pro, a protein called properdin. Properdin is a stabilizing protein. It's known to stabilize the alternative pathway C3 convertase because this C3B along with this protein BB, these two comprise a C3 convertase. Notice I said the C3 convertase is different here than the other two pathways. Remember in the other two pathways, the C3 convertase was C4B and C2B. Here it's C3B and BB. And this properdin stabilizes that C3 convertase, meaning it has C3 convertase activity. It's going to split C3 into C3A and another C3B, which remains bound. So now we have this complex that is C3B, BB, C3B. So two C3Bs and a BB. Again, stabilized by properdin. This, these three proteins now are now a C5 convertase. Okay. Again, the C5 convertase is different. In the other two pathways, C5 convertase was comprised by C4B, C2B, and C3B. Here it's a little bit different, but it's still able to convert C5 to C5A, which floats away, and C5B. Okay. Now, C5B, now is where we start, the, again, the common pathway between all pathways. C5B inserts itself into the membrane. It's going to attract a bunch of other proteins, C6, C7, C8, and a bunch of C9s. And I know I'm getting redundant with talking about this. Um, these C9s are going to orient, them, orient themselves in such a way that, number one, they completely traverse through the membrane to the intracellular side, but they're also in an arrangement that's in the shape of a pore, which is going to allow things to move out and things out here to move in. Um, we call this setup a membrane attack complex, MAC, membrane attack complex, because it's attacking the pathogen. How is it attacking it? Well, because things can freely move out and things out here can move in, the pathogen can no longer regulate its internal environment. And so it dies, it, under, it bursts, it undergoes cell lysis, and the pathogen is eliminated. So just like the classical pathway and the lectin pathway, the alternative pathway also forms a membrane attack complex to kill the cell. It's just that in the alternative pathways, you can see the players are a little bit different. We have a B protein, a hydrolyzed C3, we have a D, we have a properdin. Um, very different situation. We're going to cover this in the next video, but I want to start off by just introducing it. We had a bunch of complement proteins, right? We had C4, C2, C3, and C5. They were split into A and B components. And in general, I mean, we'll go back and just look here. The B proteins remain bound. Um, According to the new system of nomenclature, we would say C4B, C2B, C3B, and C5B remain bound. The ones that float away are C4A, C2A, C3A, and C5A, according to the um, new system of nomenclature. All right. What happens to those A fragments? Do they just are they just garbage, or do they have some other function? It turns out they have some other function. It's not like we're just going to waste them 
Uh, they actually have some other very important functions that we're going to cover in the next video. Make sure to like this video and subscribe for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.